Good afternoon, friends. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Danoon Institute of Biblical Research as well as Israeli News Live on EventmastersFX.com as well as uh, Israeli News Live on YouTube, Israeli News Live. Practically every platform I can think of, we need to share this message. And friends, I really encourage you, if you could, share this message far and wide. Uh, share it with your friends, your family, your neighbors, everybody you possibly can. Uh, you know, I spent years, years uh, pro-Zionist and, uh, and, and believe me, regardless, I still have a sincere love for those of my kindred, those of my uh, ancestry, I guess would be the best way to put it, to the uh, Israelite, the Hebrew people from all over the world, but I also have a, a profound love also for uh, the Gentiles as well all, all over the world. And much like what Jesus did himself, this is the way that I feel in my own heart. Uh, I am going to be looking at Ezekiel 36 and Ezekiel 37. Now, I did go into Ezekiel 36 a little while back, maybe about six, eight months ago, something like that. But I need to go into it again. And I want to go into Ezekiel 37. I promised back then I was going to go into Ezekiel 37, and I never actually did Ezekiel 37. Um, so much of the prophecies that we are applying for a future date you are going to be amazed at the fulfillment in the scripture. And I've been asked by you guys over and over and over, please, Brother Steve, we're confused on these things. You've been bringing out some things. Uh, you talk about taking a hold of the skirt of a Jew, a hymn that is a Jew. Uh, you, you, we're looking at all these different prophecies. But there's many more. And we're applying these to future fulfillment when they've actually been fulfilled. Uh, and let me clarify one thing. I'm not a preterist. I know some people say, oh, Steve's a preterist. I had to go figure out what a preterist was. No, I do believe there are prophecies yet to be fulfilled as well. But there are some that we do apply to future tense, which should not be, especially in the book of Jeremiah. I mean, especially in the book of Jeremiah. Can you imagine that? Jeremiah clearly showing Israel's going into captivity into Babylon and all the prophecies of them coming back, rebuilding their temple after their captivity. And yet we apply it to a future date when you know it has nothing to do with a future date. Well, Ezekiel is pretty much like a contemporary of Jeremiah anyway, so uh, well, there's not a lot of difference there. But Ezekiel writes things in ways that really kind of throw a lot of people off. Uh, now, starting off, and, and I want to just say this, those of you that have never been here before, you can find our website, IsraeliNewsLive.org. If you want to support the work, we appreciate it. You can do so by visiting our website. It's got our mailing address and, our, and also online. That, enough of that. Now, secondly, those of you that, are, that have been here on Israeli News Live uh, for many years, if you would, be sure to comment on what I'm about to say now because I didn't take the time to go back and look for it. Uh, maybe I should. Maybe I should. Uh, you know what? Just for the heck of it, let's just real quick, let's just look. The Lord's Prayer was a message I did years ago. Uh, and I actually was on to the right idea, but I made a mistake in my, uh, in, my, um, in my message on that. And it wasn't until God began to open my eyes that I was able to correct that mistake. Uh, now, oddly enough, Mark Biltz, actually when he was with Shapiro one day and they were kind of beating me up, he quotes one of my own revelations that God had given me. It was on the Lord's Prayer to Yitzhak Shapira. And, and Shapiro's like, what? Are you kidding me? And it's the Lord's Prayer, right? Uh, and, and I thought it was kind of funny because I knew where Mark got that from. And, and, and I think I shared that um, with Mark back when me and Mark did the video together. Uh, here it is right here. Uh, I shared that with Mark years ago uh, when I was in Israel. And... Uh, 
And this is it right here. September 2nd, 2011, the Lord's Prayer reveals the return of the house of Israel. All right, so yes, back in 2011, so I don't have, you don't have to worry about making a comment now, those of you that have been around. In fact, in fact somebody asked me, what does Steve look like without a beard? All right, that's what I look like without a beard. Uh, for those of you that didn't know me from way back when, that's me without a beard. I always look younger without a beard too, so anyway. Uh, I thought about getting rid of my beard. My wife said, no, she likes it. She's used to it. That's the way she's, you know, she had me both ways. So it doesn't matter. Uh, but at any rate, that's when it was done. Back September 2nd, 2011, I brought that message. That's when God revealed it to my heart. And, and I was actually correct that it is the return of the house of Israel. The only thing is, I didn't realize that Israel, house of Israel had already returned. And a lot of people are saying, no, that can't be so especially our friends that are that are hebrew roots things like that you're believing that the house of israel is going to return but yet that can't be the case for the simple reason is if you go to acts chapter 2 right here plain as day when paul speaks in verse 36 therefore let all the house of israel know assuredly that god hath made that same jesus whom you have crucified both lord and christ what do you know Paul puts the house of Israel back in Jerusalem right after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. All right. Uh, and actually, actually, Peter was quoting those words. Peter was quoting it. So if Peter was quoting it. And then he takes that from um, when all these different nations were there and they were from all over the world. Right. Now, it says on there, Jews, but in the Greek, it's Judeans. In other words, they were not born in Israel. They were living in other lands, but they were from the homeland, the birth land. Uh, and we're going to be speaking about that here in just a little bit. But let's start right here at the beginning. Uh, Luke chapter 11, uh, where they ask about the Lord's pr uh, how to pray. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, when you pray, so Jesus decided to teach him, when you pray, this is what you say. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thine will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. Now we know the rest of the prayer. Give us this day, day our daily bread, forgive us of our sins. This is also important. Forgive us of our sins as we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's important as well as part of the prayer. Right? And he said unto them, which of you shall have a... Okay. All right. So th then he ends the prayer, right? Give us this day our daily bread. The daily bread is the word of God. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Right? And the, and the forgiving of sins. What was he teaching his apostles? He was teaching them not only to pray for themselves, but to pray for the house of Israel. And that's what God revealed to me back in 2011, some nine years ago, almost, uh, well, yeah, nine years ago, this, well, hey, that's funny. Look at here. Oh my gosh, this is the anniversary of the day that God gave me that message. What do you know? September 2nd, 2011 is September 2nd, 2020. Nine years later, God is now letting me bring this out and giving you the full revelation of it. I had no idea. So that's exciting to me. It, it really is. It's exciting to me to be able to see that. All right. So anyway, the Lord said, how would be thy name? And I remember years ago, I thought, how would be thy name? Oh, well, I was like, that didn't make sense. You know, the word, to, to, in other words, to sanctify God's name. How do you, how does God's name become unsanctified? All right. So Jesus is telling them, pray to, to sanctify God's name and that thy kingdom come, thy will will be done. So in other words, what is it? Christ came to his own, his own received him not. But Israel is not just three tribes. Israel is 12 tribes. So he's telling them to pray in that manner, right? So I remember when I was reading in Ezekiel years ago, of course, back then as well. That's when it all began back in uh, 2011. And probably before then, it's just that's when I did the video on it. Um, 
we get this very interesting uh, scripture here in Ezekiel when Ezekiel is prophesying and it starts off right here. I'll kind of, let me see, I might need to make this a little bigger for you guys. Let's just see. So we'll make sure you guys can see this. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, surely in the fire of my jealousy have I spoken against the residue of the nations against all of Edom that have appointed my land unto themselves for possession with the joy of their heart with a disdain of soul to cast it out for a prey. Actually, before I get into that, I, I'm go I gotta go into this as well, but let's go down. So I first set the, set the foundation of this. Um, and then we're gonna back up so we see how the fulfillment of this is actually done. Okay, here it is. It's in verse 20. And when they came into the nations, whether they came, they profaned my holy name. Who's he talking about? He's talking about the house of Israel. Specifically, he says it in there, house of Israel. And that men said of them, these are the people of the Lord and are gone forth out of his land. This was, he's quoting back about 780 BC before the coming of Christ when the house of Israel was dispersed into all the land because of their idolatry and sin. See, they profaned my holy name. So how did God's name become uns unsanctified? And Jesus said to pray that hallowed be thy name. In other words, sanctify thy name. Well, their name became unsanctified because the house of Israel was no longer living in the promised land. But you got to remember, the promised land, though, is not technically the state of Israel. It's Christ. All right? That's something you really got to pay attention to. Everything is symbolic. The land flowing of milk and honey is all about Jesus Christ. You go to Israel. Israel does not blossom like a rose. But yeah, if you can add some water to it, it's got some good fertile soil. I'll agree with that. But it's Christ. He was the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. Right? He's everything. He's what makes everything flourish. He's what makes the land to grow. All right. So he says, they profane my holy name and the men have said of them, these are the people of the Lord and are gone forth out of his, out of his land. But I had pity for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations, whether they came. In other words, no, no matter where they went, because they were not in the land, the name of God was being profaned. Therefore, say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name which you have profaned among the nations, whether you came. And I will sanctify my great name, which hath been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in the midst of them. And the nations will know, shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the nations and gather you out of all the countries and will bring you into your own land. And I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. What is, what is the sprinkling of clean water upon them? It's water baptism. What was John doing in the river? Water baptizing. Right? After, over here in the book of Acts, when they begin to believe that Jesus was the Messiah, and of course we see that these are people from Perithians, Medes, Elamites, dwellers of Mesopotamia, Judea, uh, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, all these lands, Egypt, Libya, Cyrene, strangers of Rome, proselytes, Cretes, Arabians. We do hear the wonderful works of God. Right? God is with us. Emmanuel. They take all the skirt of him that is a Jew. Ten people of the nations being fulfilled right there in Acts chapter, chapter 2. And they were all amazed and they want to know what this meant, right? But what happens? After they actually believed, what did they do in verse 40? And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves into this untoward generation. What was the untoward generation? That was those Nephilim that were intermingled amongst the Asmonean dynasty, the Pharisees and Sadducees. And then they, they that gladly received his word were what? Baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. What were those 3,000 souls? Well, look right here. Here they are. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. 
And now when they heard this, who? Who heard it? The house of Israel heard it. They were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Okay, what did it say over in Ezekiel? And I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of the flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put what? My spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep mine ordinances and do them. That's the house of Israel. You mean to tell me there's another Savior coming? You mean to tell me Jesus has got to come down and be re-crucified over again? No. He was crucified 2,000 years ago and fulfilled that prophecy of Ezekiel 36 and Ezekiel 37 back then. Right? So Jesus, when he taught his apostles to pray, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thine will be done as in heaven, so as it in earth. Let me make that a little bit bigger for you. See? So make sure you guys are seeing this on the screen there. All right? Give us this day our daily bread. And what? Forgive us of our sins, for we also are, will also forgive everyone that is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Of course, his is the, his is the power, the glory forever and ever, right? Wow. So then what happened? Like I said, though, Acts chapter 2. We're seeing the fulfillment of there of it. They were pricked in their hearts. They were baptized, right? Get on further down. And the same day there were added 3,000 souls. <laughs> they, they, see, what did, they, what did they want, though? You got to remember, what was it that they wanted? When they saw, because you got to remember, when they came out of that upper room, what was going on? What was going on? See, and there appeared, this was the house of Judah. This was the hundred and, uh, 120 that were in the upper room. See? What does it say? And they appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of a fire set upon each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to spake with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem that word, forget using the word Jews. It doesn't say Jews in the Greek language. It says Judeans. Devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. <laughs> there, 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 by the way, is the miracle itself. It's what they, they were hearing in their own language. All right? And they were all amazed at one and marveled, saying to one another, Behold, are not all these that speak Galileans? And how here we every man born in our own tongue wherein we were born? So it wasn't they were speaking like, an, like, like, like what some people call today tongues today, an unknown tongue. They were speaking, but the people were hearing in their own languages. So that's what was happening. And then it tells you where they were from. And they were amazed. But they wanted to know, how can we receive what you've got? Right? When we get further down. And of course, that's when we know that it identifies the house of Israel. Because Peter gives them all the prophecies about it, or many of the prophecies. And he said, therefore, let all the house of Israel know surely that the God hath made that same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And they heard this. They were pricked in their heart. They said, unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? <laughs> That's Ezekiel for you. God had already prophesied to Ezekiel what was going to happen. Now let's back up just a little bit though. We'll start back up here a little bit further in Ezekiel. I'll show you some other things here, right? Therefore thus saith the Lord, God surely in the fire of my jealousy have I spoken against the residue of the nations and against all of Edom that have appointed my land unto themselves for possession with the joy of all their heart with a disdain of soul to cast it out for a prey. 
Yeah. Edom, which that you'd had a lot of, you know, Edom is also symbolic. You got to remember, Edom is symbolic. Because why? Uh, originally, Esau had gone in and married in amongst the daughters of the Nephilim race. This is why God was angry with him. So, we see this, and it goes on to say, Therefore prophesy concerning the land of Israel, and say unto the mountains, and to the hills, and to the streams of the valleys, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I have spoken in my jealousy and in my fury, because you have borne the shame of the nations. Sure they did. They've borne that shame of the nations because they went into idolatry just like later Judah, the house of Judah, would do the exact same thing. And when Jesus came on the scene, he accused them of that. Of course, Ezra also accused the priests and Levites of mingling their seed, doing after the abominations of the nations with the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, which was exactly what the scripture said they did. When Israel had came into the land, they were to drive out the inhabitants of the land and kill them all off because they were mingled amongst the Nephilim race. You know, what's interesting, if you go back to the where God meets Abraham about Sodom and Gomorrah, did you ever notice when God says to Abraham, you know, because he's asking if there'd be uh, 50 righteous, would you spare it if there's 40, 30, 20, all the way down to 10. If there's 10 righteous in the city, would you spare the city for the sake of the 10? Because he knew his nephew Lot was down there. And God gets all the way down to 10. He says, if there's 10, I'll spare for the 10. Now, something I never paid attention to before, Lot was not included in the 10 righteous. God was talking about if he could find 10 people in Sodom and Gomorrah that had not mingled their seed with a Nephilim bloodline, he would spare that city for the sake of that 10. I'd never caught that till today. This is why Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed, because he couldn't find even 10. It's the same thing before the flood. God saved the eight souls in the ark. But the rest of the world was destroyed because of the mingling of the seed with all these fallen angels. Hmm. What a mess. So he goes on further. Let's jump to verse 8. But you, O mountains of Israel, you shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel, for they are at hand to come. See, what is it? You shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people for they are at hand to come. What is it? What, what was Jesus called? He is the both root and branch. He is the, off, he is the, he is the root of Jesse. He is the righteous branch of Israel. Paul goes further and says, you are, ye are the branches. And the unbelieving branches were cut out of the tree because of unbelief, but the Gentiles were grafted in. But again, what is it? What is this here? Your branches yield your fruit to my people. What, what is he speaking of in chapter 8 right here? That was what? The house of Judah. That 120 in the upper room, they were grafted into Christ. They were actually part, not grafted, but they were, they were part of, of the tree, that righteous olive tree of Jesus Christ. They were the first fruits that were being, being offered up unto God, so to speak. And that fruit is exactly what the house of Israel had need of to partake of. So when they were there on the day of Pentecost, they were receiving the fruit from the tree itself because the branches were bearing that fruit. For behold, I am for you, and I will turn unto you, and you shall be tilled and sown. The sowing is a sowing. What did Jesus say? There were seeds that were cast out, some by the wayside, some over here, some by in the thorns, etc., but some went into good ground. What did Jesus do when, when he came? Uh, let's see here. Let me show you this one. Right here, I think it's over here in John. Oh, maybe the wrong way. 
I'm going. Yeah, here we go. Remember after Jesus' resurrection, Jesus said unto them again, Peace be unto you. This is after the resurrection. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. When he said this, he breathed on them, saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. What did he do on them? He breathed on them. Okay? He breathed on them and said, Receive you the Holy Ghost. What was that? That was planting the seed of life within them. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted. Unto them, whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. Now remember also, what did he say? What, what did Jesus say to us? And uh, oh, Go only. Lost sheep, right? Let me just pull this up so I got it for you real quick. Mm. Got to get the right wording there. Okay? Matthew 15, 24. Right? Let's pull it up real quick. Matthew 15, 24. Don't want to leave anything undone, dear friends, because, you know, the thing is, later you might have a question, and, and I don't know, maybe the question, you got it right now, and God knows you're going to have it, so we need to just answer it real quick. And so I just want to, as a reminder to you, here we go right here. What does Jesus say to them? Whoa, messed up there, hang on. Don't know if I got a, yeah, Matthew 15, drop way down here to verse... All right? But he answered and said her not a word, and his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You remember also he sent his, he sent his apostles out. By the way, I'm going to get to that in just a moment. So a little fragment there of about his, uh, speaking about Ezekiel there in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, let's see. No. Yeah, here it is. Matthew 10.6. That's actually the one I was looking for. Matthew 10.6. Um, but Jesus also talks about that he was sent to the house of the sheep, uh, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. All right? And then in Matthew 10.6, what do we have here? These 12 Jesus sent forth, right? He sent them forth and commanded them, saying, Go not in the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay? Hold that right there. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. What's the Lord's prayer? Right? Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done as in heaven, so on earth. Sanctify your name. So they were to be praying for the return of the house of Israel, that the kingdom comes. And what did he tell them to go preach? As you go preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And they were going to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And in Acts, we find out the lost sheep of the house of Israel have already come home. So we jump back over here to Ezekiel again. Behold, I am for you. I will turn unto you, and you shall be tilled and sown, as I said. And I will multiply men upon you in the house of Israel, even all of it, and the cities shall be inhabited, and the waste places shall be builded. And I will multiply upon you men and beasts, and they shall increase and be fruitful, and I will cause you to inhabit after your former estate, and I will do better unto you than at your beginnings, and you shall know that I am the Lord. I'll do better to you than it's your beginnings. How much greater could it be that the house of Israel could have than to know that Jesus Christ is indeed the Son of Almighty God and that He has came and gave them life and brought a remnant back and filled them with the Holy Spirit according to the prophecies that were promised unto them. I will cause men to walk upon you. Right, let's go further down. Therefore thou shalt devour men no more, neither bereave there thy nations any more, saith the Lord God. A true believer in Christ, he doesn't pick up the sword and go back out to war again. 
Neither will I suffer the shame of the, of the nations any more to be heard against thee. Neither shalt thou bear the reproach of, of the peoples any more. Either shalt thou cause thy nations to stumble any more, saith the Lord God. Because now they have the words of Christ. Ezekiel 36, his name, thy, because they had profaned his holy name, because they were not in Christ. And so he had to bring them back. He had to bring back that remnant in order for the scripture to be fulfilled. Right? So this is what we saw in the book of Acts. That was the fulfillment thereof. Now, there's other ones we could look at as well. Uh, what does it say in Isaiah? Isaiah chapter 10, I believe it is. A remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, unto the into the they put on there, uh, unto God the mighty. It's actually El Gibor, the mighty God. For though thy people, O Israel, be as the sand of sea, only a remnant of them shall return. Think about that one. Only a remnant would return. And then we see it in the book of Acts right there. What do we have? We have just a remnant of them being there. That's all that's there, just a remnant. They were dwelling from all those different nations, but they were there, a remnant. Did not, did not uh, Paul also say this in the book of Romans? See, what does he say right here? Isaiah also cries concerning, Isaiah, uh, concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. What was that short work? And do you realize he's actually referring right there when he says cut it short, he's talking about Daniel 9 where the Messiah shall be cut off but not for himself. The work was short. Three and a half years. A short work would the Lord do upon the earth. You're looking for fulfillment. There it was. And Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabbath had left us a seed, we had been as Sodom and been likened unto Gomorrah. Now, in Hebrew, the word in Isaiah was used was a remnant. But still, the Greek word is a seed. Why, did, why, do, why does Paul actually use the word seed? Because he knows that they had mingled the seed so bad. The house of Israel was so bad, marrying in amongst the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Jebusites, just like the priests did over in Babylon, that if it hadn't have been for the sake of God Almighty to make sure some of them didn't do that, there would be no house of Israel. No wonder why there's only a remnant. <laughs> it's unreal, isn't it? It's just amazing to me. Absolutely amazing. And by the way, that mighty God right there, a remnant shall return even the remnant of Jacob unto the mighty God, El Gibor. What mighty God is he talking about? Go back to Isaiah chapter 9, right? For a child is born unto us, a son is given unto us, and the government is upon his shoulder. His name is called Shemot. Peleo es el Gibor. Right there. This guy, this side here, they don't want to translate that because they don't want to offend the people in Israel or the Jewish people of today. No, he's called El Gibor. And to my Jewish friends all over the world, except that you recognize that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you will die in your sins. And for those of you that are thinking the house of Israel is coming home, the house of Israel came home 2,000 years ago. What are you waiting for? You go back to the Hebrew roots and things like that, you're going right back under the law of the very thing that Christ came and he said the whole law, the whole commandments, he didn't say the Levitical law, but the whole commandments hang on to. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and love thy neighbor as yourself. And all the, the whole law hangs on those two right there. Mm. Blessed be the Lord. But you'll go right back. And you're trying to put you messianic ministers are trying to put the Christians up underneath. You said the law is going to come out of Jerusalem. It did 2,000 years ago. Christ came out. And he gave, he established the true law. Just like Levi wrote in the Dead Sea Scrolls writing. Literally in the Dead Sea Scrolls he says it as well. Yeah, you, you know, I'd, be, I'd really like to know how much of that you guys hid over there in Israel. And the Vatican as well. How much did you guys hide from the people that really would have proved who Christ was and you didn't want nobody to know? 
How many more of the prophecies? Because you let some slip through the cracks, but how many more got hidden? <laughs> I'm really curious myself. At any rate, though, so there's the El Gibor. He is the mighty God, right? Now, let me look over here. I had over here also in uh, Isaiah. Oh, the... Yeah, here we go. Learn to do well. Seek justice. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat of the good land. Christ was that good land. He is the land flowing with milk and honey. I want to jump over to Ezekiel 37 real quick. And I want to just share some thoughts with you here from Ezekiel 37. And there again, it'll prove to you. You're, you're, we're, we've been applying. I was guilty of it as well. I, all right, and I'm sorry. But I've got to, we've, got to, we've got to straighten this out, right? We get Ezekiel 37. The, the hand of the Lord was upon me and the Lord carried me out in the spirit and set me down in the midst of the valley and it was full of bones. And he caused me to pass by them round about and behold, there were very many in the open valley and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Then he said unto me, Prophesy over these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. What does it say here in the book of John chapter 20? Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he said, had said this after the resurrection, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. Now, remember, he breathed on them, right? There's that breath of life. The only one that has the breath of life is Jesus Christ. And so what happened? See, Ezekiel is talking about that they're going to come back to life again. Okay? Now, interesting. I said about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Let me show to you this right here. Oh, goodness. How do I make this big? Hmm. Okay, right here. I can make it big right there. Whoop, too big. All right, this is from uh, 4Q386 and three, or 385. Okay, fragment. Now, Lord, when will these things come to pass? Talking about Ezekiel's dry bones, right? And the Lord said to me, a tree will bend and stand up. All right, now let me just back up. And he said, Again, prophesy concerning the four winds in heaven and let the winds of heavens blow on them and they shall live. And a great crowd of men revived and blessed the Lord of hosts who made them live. And I said, Lord, when will these things come to pass? And the Lord said to me, a tree will bend and stand up. Who is the tree of life? Jesus Christ. Why does it say a tree will bend? He'll come down. He'll humble himself and come down to this earth. There's another little part in here where it says right here in the, in the fragment, and their graves they shall lie until. So they're laying in their graves until the Lord himself comes. That tree that will bend and stand up. I just thought that was a little interesting thought to put in there, right? Because he talks about the sinews coming upon him. So let's take a look then. Matthew chapter 27, And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. There's another scripture. Let me just pull it up real quick. Let's 
See if I can find this just right. Ephesians 4, 8. All right, so let's pull it to where you guys can see this. Ephesians 4, 8, and we're going to close here in just a second here. All right, where do we have Ephesians at here? Ephesians chapter 4, and we get to verse 8. We'll start verse 7. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Could that have something to do? He preached to the souls that were imprisoned, if I remember right. Let's see if we find that one. Now that could be the fallen angels as far as, uh, no, I don't know how to, don't know how to look it up. We'll, we'll say it for another day. The point is, is that Jesus Christ, when the graves were open, many of the bodies of the saints which slept arose. And a lot of times we just think of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But maybe it has something to do with Ezekiel 37 as well, right? Just maybe it does. What do we have over here? Okay, we already, we already talked about that one there. So at any rate there, when we look at this, then said, then said he unto me, prophesy unto the breath, el ruach. Prophesy, son of man, say to the breath, thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. When Jesus Christ breathed even upon his apostles and told them to receive the Holy Spirit, that was showing that he is the breath. He is the life. He is that tree that would bend, wrote, wrote over there in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And, and you know, really what you're reading in the Dead Sea Scrolls, you're reading the, a fragment of the book of Ezekiel. So it looks like maybe there was a sentence in there that we didn't have in our Ezekiel that they had in theirs. I find it all fascinating. But one thing's for sure. The house of Israel has already come home. We are living in the final hours, the final days of humanity. And right now, they're going to be doing over here in Washington, D.C., this return conference. They're going to take you and put you underneath Talmudic rabbis. They're going to put you under an antichrist system is what they're going to do. They're going to say that the house of Israel is ready to return home. And maybe, who knows, maybe even Israel will open up the borders to those Noahides and Messianic believers that will deny Jesus Christ and accept this new way. I caution you strongly, friends, because Scripture, so much of what they apply to the future has been fulfilled. And do you realize that even like your Palestinians that are there, many of these Palestinians are parts of the house of Israel, parts of the house of Judah that have been left behind during the siege of Titus when they didn't kill off the farmers. They've been there all these years. What a shame what happens to them. Listen, if you appreciate the message today, if it's a blessing to you and you want to support the work we do here, we really appreciate, need your support as well, but we appreciate it. And I realize with the way the things are going in the economy, I want you to take care of your own family first. That's what matters to me. But if God lays on your heart to help us, I don't think there's much time left, no way. So whatever you do will be what helps us during the times where we can't be a part of each other's lives. We'll stay working no matter what it takes. Even when the economy crashes, we'll still be working so long as we can get this message out to you. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live and Danoon Institute. God bless you.